Peter got dropped off and apparently the school left and didn't know anybody was here. So, Hi. So we're going to be in Daniel um, 8 and 9 today, but we're going to cover a little more territory than that. So you can open to Daniel, but also um, if you open to your, your little notes there. Today is uh, the Jewish Day of Atonement. It started last night at sundown, and since we're just now moving into sundown here, it's ending, and of course it starts at different times around the world, depending on when sunset is. And, um, so in Israel, it started roughly six or seven hours before it started in the U.S., and then um, it finished earlier. But the Day of Atonement is one of seven very important feasts or uh, holidays in Israel. The, in your notes there, the major Jewish holidays are Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits which are the early festivals. They're all one continuous eight-day festival occurring about this in the spring, roughly the same time as Easter celebration. Of course, Jesus was sacrificed and, uh, on Passover and was raised from the dead on the day of first fruits. And so fulfilling those feasts. And then Pentecost comes roughly 50 days later uh, from first fruits. And of course, we know that in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit was poured out on Pentecost. And then the fall feasts are tabernacles, trumpets, and the Day of Atonement. And um, uh, the Day of Atonement is the day we're talking about today. And so the Jewish name for the Day of Atonement is Yom Kippur. Um, it's spelled many different ways in English, but it's in Hebrew the letters are not exactly transferable or, or they're not the same. So you'll see Kippur, you know, E-R, you'll see O-R, U-R, you'll see it spelled various ways. But it's the Day of Atonement this year, October 8 and 9. Uh, next comes Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles on the 13th through the 20th. And so these fall festivals, these fall um, celebrations in Judaism are very important. And the, the Feast of Trumpets or Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, was on the 29th and 30th. And uh, it gives us a prophetic picture of the return of Jesus Christ. You know, in the New Testament, there's a number of references to the trumpets sounding and, and uh Jesus coming, Matthew 24, 31. He shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet. They shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, uh, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. And so we, we connect the trumpet with... Um, uh, with the return of Jesus Christ. Did you try to come earlier and the gate was locked? No, sir. Oh, you didn't. I was so afraid you got turned away. The gate got locked accidentally. Well, it, I didn't get here till just about quarter till seven and the gate was locked. Of course, nobody's here other than Peter was inside. So I'm glad you made it. I'm glad all y'all made it, but I thought he comes early normally. You normally get here about five, don't you? Look who showed up, Peter. We were feeling terrible. We thought we locked you out. Okay. So if you got your notes, um, Stephen, I'm, I'm talking about the Day of Atonement. And so uh, October 8th and 9th, the, the second of the fall feast is actually a fast. And we know that in Christianity, Jesus has provided our atonement. But I want to talk about the Day of Atonement a little bit more in a moment. And then the Feast of Tabernacles is coming up in a, um, about 10 days, a little over... 10 days, two weeks. It's a prophetic picture of the millennium or heaven. Uh, it reveals Jesus as the bridegroom who lives with us. In John 1.14, John uh, actually used the word tabernacled among us, and it's translated dwelt among us normally, but uh, he fulfilled in part the Feast of Tabernacles by becoming God with us for a season. And of course, he's coming back again, Revelation 21.3. 
I heard a great voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. They shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And so there's coming a future fulfillment of tabernacles as well. Jesus may have been born during the Feast of Tabernacles, but we'll, we'll talk about it another time. And so Jesus and the Day of Atonement. Let me just drill down on that a little bit. We read about the Day of Atonement in Leviticus, um, reading from Leviticus 23, 27. Also on the tenth day of the seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall afflict your souls. That afflict your souls the Jews take as a fast. And so these other festivals are feast days. This is a, a fast day. That's the afflicting of the souls, as the King James puts it. And offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day, for it's a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. And so you know this um, uh, date was set aside annually for the atonement of the sins of Israel. Um, it was the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. It still is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. And um, I'll get into the notes in a second. But the Jews believe that each person is weighed in the eyes of God on the Day of Atonement to determine whether you get another year of life or not. So not that you necessarily will die on the Day of Atonement, but in the, in the months that go um, after that, you know, that it's a review of your lifetime. And so it's a, it's a, various, it's a very serious day of introspection. Um, it's a day that the Jews go and make amends if they know that there's something that they've done that's on the slate of heaven, on God's... Um, uh, board before him, they go and try to make amends. It's the one day of the year in Judaism that each individual could receive atonement for their sins. Uh, it's the holiest day of the year. It was spent in fasting and prayer and confession of sins. And this is the day the Holy of Holies, um, the high priest entered the Holy of Holies once and uh, pronounced the sacred name of God all of the people would fall down and worship as the high priest pronounced the sacred name and then he would make atonement for the sins of the nation um, in the Holy of Holies. So sins are atoned for, iniquities are atoned for, transgressions um, under the, the notes, I just break it down a little bit, vanity and perversity, unforgiveness, any intentional or unwitting behavior that's contrary to the will of God, also deliberate rebellion against God and God's word. Uh, moral or physical impurity, everything you don't want God to judge. And there was atonement for individual Jews or believers, which of course for us as Christians is a type of you and I. Atonement for Aaron and his family, uh, which is a type of ministers and preachers like myself. Atonement for the nation, and um, every nation of course needs forgiveness in the eyes of God. And atonement for the sanctuary. Um, this was unique, but it's a type, if you will, of every church. Every church needs atonement. Prophetic picture of the atonement is the cross. Jesus, of course, the perfect sacrifice, the atonement for sins for all mankind. Um, and the New Testament bears this out. In Colossians, we read in chapter 2, verse 16, Don't let anyone make rules for you about eating or drinking or about Jewish customs, such as festivals, new moon celebrations, or Sabbath days. In the past, these things were like a shadow that showed what was coming. But the new things that were coming are found in Christ. And so all of these feasts and festivals, I, I honor them, I use them for teaching and so forth, but we don't hold to them um, by rote because in the New Testament, they're fulfilled in Christ. They were the signpost pointing towards Jesus, now they're fulfilled. And so um, I know that some believers like to set aside the Day of Atonement to... Um, I like myself, I fasted today to pray for the Jews. That's fine, but it's not a law. It's something we do out of our own conscience, out of our own hearts. Before God, if you want to do that, that's fine. I know some believers celebrate the other feasts and festivals with Christ and the Passover and so forth. That's fine too, as long as you don't make it a law that you've got to. When it becomes a law, it moves into legalism. And of course, uh, the New Testament warns against that type of legalism. But as for the atonement, Isaiah had prophesied uh, that there was one coming who was going to receive the iniquity of all of us. Isaiah 53, verse 6, All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So not an animal, but a person. 
He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He's brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. And so we, we see that from the New Testament as uh, being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then Romans chapter 5 verse 11 explicitly says, We also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. That's about as explicit a text as you can find that he has fulfilled uh, the atonement in the sacrifice of the cross. And so I want to just back, back up a second because it becomes relevant to what we're doing today. At the top of the notes where I had October 8 and 9, the Day of Atonement, you see that this is the Jewish year now, 5780. Does everybody see that? And so the Jewish calendar is on a lunar calendar. It's a seven-year cycle. It's not a one-year cycle. It's a seven-year cycle. Uh, because it's a lunar cycle, the, the lunar um, months are shorter series of days than our uh, 30, 31 days. They always run shorter than that, usually 28, 29 days. And so in the seven-year cycle of their calendar, some years have 12 months, some years have 13 months. And so whenever you look at biblical prophecy and they're prophesying years, they're prophesying in Hebraic years. They're not prophesying in our Greco-Roman years. You follow me? Because they're not using a solar calendar. They're using a lunar calendar. So a lot of times you'll see these uh, predictions. I'm going to get into some of the traditional ones tonight. And I'm not trying to debunk anybody's theology. But there's a lot of stuff that we have kind of agreed on, and I'm talking about the body of Christ down through the years, that may or may not be true. There's a lot of theories out there about some of the things in Daniel as far as the timing and so forth that may or may not be true. And a number of the theories are based on solar calendars. That's why I'm bringing this up. And so I'm pointing out to you that was not the calendar they used. Um, that being the case... Some of these things we'll, we'll know more when the, when the time comes, you know, when the Lord decides to reveal them. So before we start tonight, I want to pray for the, uh, the Bible study, but I also want to pray for this Day of Atonement and the Jewish people, because um, this is a sacred time of year for them, and um, like many of you, um, I pray for them to have their eyes opened, and I just want you to join with me if you would. So Lord, we just pray that uh, this would be the year that your Jewish people receive their Jewish Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus of Bethlehem, Jesus the Messiah and the Son of God. Lord, we know that they're still looking for another Messiah. I pray, God, that this would be the year that their eyes are open to see that Jesus fulfilled the scriptures, the prophets, the feasts, the festivals, the Sabbath, Lord, that he is the fulfillment of all of the promises of God in the Old Testament and the New. And Lord, I just ask that um, there would be a supernatural opening of the eyes, just as you prophesied to Isaiah that the, the Jewish people's eyes and ears would be spiritually closed for a season. We ask you now, Lord, that you would open their eyes and ears, that they would be able to see Jesus in the text of the Old Covenant Scriptures. And as they celebrate each of these um, uh, festivals, Lord, I just pray that Jesus would be at the forefront of what they see. Open the eyes of the scholars, the rabbis, the, the common lay people in the synagogues, Lord, around the world. Just open their eyes and give great grace to your Jewish people. Favor. Open the eyes of the brothers and sisters of Jesus in the natural. Let them see him for who he is. In his name we pray. Amen. So last week we went through Daniel chapter 7, which I told you, in my opinion, is one of the... Ten most important chapters in the Bible. And I'm not going to um, go through chapter 7 again, but a little bit later in the study tonight, we're going to go back and examine some of the times that were predicted in Daniel chapter 7. So I'll talk about that a little bit. But first, let's look at um, Daniel chapter 8 and 9. And so it starts in Daniel chapter 8, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar. Now, this is the same guy who in chapter 5 had the writing on the wall the last night of his life. So obviously chapter 5 is out of sequence timing-wise. But if you remember last week, I told you that the Aramaic ends um, 
in chapter 7. So the uh, chapter 2, most of chapter 2, and all of the rest up through chapter 7 are written in Aramaic and not in Hebrew. And for some reason, the compilers of the book of Daniel, whether it was Daniel himself or some redactor afterwards, did not put these scriptures about Belshazzar in order. They chose to group the Aramaic text together for whatever reason. So Belshazzar in chapter 8, chapter 8 would have occurred um, well before chapter 5. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, who was a successor to Nebuchadnezzar, a vision appeared to me, even to me, Daniel, after that, which appeared to me at the first. Now I saw in the vision, it came to pass that I was at Sushan in the palace. This is the same place that's mentioned in the book of Esther, Sushan the palace, which um, the time of the Persian Empire, this is under the Babylonian King Belshazzar, but the Babylonians conquered it and became, I mean, the Persians conquered the Babylonians that became their headquarters. And at the time of Esther, that was where King Ahasuerus was reigning. It's in the province of Elam, and I saw a vision as I was by the river of Ulai. And I lifted up my eyes, and I saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher came up last. And the ram was pushing westward and northward and southward so that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hands, and he did according to his will, and he became great. And as I was considering this, behold, a he-goat came from the west. And so we've got these, these two animals, this ram and this goat. Now, we've been going through Daniel, and last week I gave you some charts of um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream in chapter 2, and then we talked about the, the other visions that had occurred and dreams with the different animals and the traditional representations. I mentioned to you that the only one that had been named was Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. He was the head of gold. The rest of them were guessing at. But here in chapter 8, we're going to be told in a few minutes that the ram and the he-goat represent specifically the Medo-Persian Empire and Greece. And so within the text, we get the interpretation of this. And so um, in verse 5, I was considering, uh, behold, a he-goat came up from the west on the face of the earth. He was hovering over the ground, and he had a, a big horn between his eyes. So he's like a, a unicorn goat. He had one big horn, interestingly. He came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river, and ran at him in a fury of his power. I saw him close to the ram, and he was moved um, with great rage against him, and he, he smote the ram, broke his two horns, and there was no power left in the ram to stand before him. Then he stomped on him, and, and uh, nobody could deliver um, the ram from him. In verse 8, therefore the, the male goat got very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken. So this big unicorn horn was broken off, and four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. I want to just pause right there a second. So in a few minutes, we're, as I said, the text itself is going to reveal this, this second goat, this he goat, very great and strong as being Greece. And so the, the uh, four um, horn, the one horn was broken off, the four notable ones came up. It's a historical fact that Alexander the Great was the, the first major political leader um, of the Greeks. His father was a leader, but he's not a world conqueror. So Alexander was um, uh, a world conqueror. It's generally believed that he is the one that's referred to as the great horn here, pointing that out. We'll talk about it some more in a moment. And the four notable ones that came up after Alexander um, died, it is a historical fact that his kingdom was divided into four of his generals' care. And so four of his, his generals um, uh, became rulers over all that he had conquered. So a lot of people look at this text, and, and you can as well, and say, well, this speaks clearly about these four generals that were given uh, the kingdom of Alexander the Great. Verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a little horn who waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land or the beautiful land. Now, what do you think the beautiful land would be in this text? Remember, Daniel's a Jew. And uh, uh, there's this reference to the beautiful land, and the prophecy is intentionally vague, but it refers to something. So what, do you, what would you assume the beautiful land referred to? Somebody help me. 
That would be my guess. Yeah, the beautiful land would be uh, the pleasant land. That would be um, the glorious land. Some some texts have it as the glorious land. I think it refers to Israel. I think that's what the prophecy was talking about. So this fourth um, uh, king that received Greece, we're going to find out, this one little horn rises up out of it and comes against Israel. In verse 10, it waxes great, even to the host of heaven. And so this... Uh, this horn, there's a supernatural aspect aspect to this being. There's something going on that has to do with spiritual warfare too. Remember, Daniel's already given us a peek at spiritual warfare with the prince of Greece and so forth, prince of Persia. And he cast down some of the host and the stars to the ground and stomped upon them. So that if this is indeed talking about the angelic host of the heaven, this individual is something more than just a regular guy. You know, he's not a, an ordinary human being. Yet he magnified himself even to the prince of the host. The prince of the host may refer to Michael. It may refer to Gabriel. may refer to Jesus. We don't know. You know, we believe that when um, uh, Joshua met the captain of the host and he said, you know, who are you for? Are you for us? Are you for our enemies? And he said, neither one. I'm for the Lord and I'm in charge of the Lord's army. Most people believe that that was Jesus. So the prince of the host may refer to Jesus himself. We don't know. But he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, verse, verse 11 says, or even trying to exalt himself as high as the prince of the host, whoever that is. And by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And so this, this daily sacrifice, once again, our assumption is this is talking about the tabernacle in Israel, in Jerusalem. But when this was written, it did not exist. Remember, the Babylonians had destroyed it. So this is talking about something that is not currently operational, if it's speaking about the, um, the temple in Israel, the temple sacrifice. Verse 12, And a host was given to him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground. It practiced and prospered. And so I want to just, just stop right there a second. So Daniel gets another vision. It's a vision about a ram and a goat fighting. And then um, there's all this exchange about the ram and the goat. And, and uh, um, the goat got very powerful. He, he um, uh, had one great big horn. The one great big horn was broken off. He had four new horns. One of the four horns was broken off. And then a little tiny horn broke off that had supernatural authority of some sort to deal with the host of heaven and it had some influence on stopping the sacrifice in the tabernacle itself. By the way, the sacrifice was stopped in the tabernacle uh, at various times. Um, it was stopped, of course, with the destruction of the tabernacle, 586 BC with the Babylonians. It was also stopped around um, the second century BC by one of these descendants of the four leaders of the Greek empire, a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes, stopped the daily sacrifice. So a lot of Jewish scholars think that this talks about that guy, that he was the um, descendant out of the one horn, this Antiochus Epiphanes. I'll come back to him in a moment too. But in verse 13, Daniel heard, he says, one saint speaking to another saint and said to that certain saint, so this, this word saint, does anybody have another word? I know you've got the amplified. What do you have in verse 13? A holy one. That's what it is. It's a kadashim. Remember, we talked about these holy ones previously. And so here, the King James calls them saints. But we don't know whether they're angelic beings, whether they are um, glorified human beings that are now with the Lord. We don't know who these guys are. And so they, sometimes they translate it as angel, sometimes they translate it as saint, sometimes they do holy one. The truth is, we don't know. They're not normal, regular people. That much we know. So I heard one saint speaking to another saint and said uh, to that certain saint which spoke, How long shall the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation? to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot. In other words, when, this going to, when is this going to happen? And he said to me, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleaned, cleansed. So in 2,300 days, the sanctuary is going to be cleansed. Okay. Sanctuary didn't exist when this prophecy was given. 
The temple was not rebuilt in 2300 days. This is like 2300 days is like eight years approximately, right? Nothing happened in eight years as far as we know, as far as sacrifice being reestablished. So this is talking about something uh, mystical. It's talking about something that's, that's not clearly just 2300 days. Or if it's talking about something 2300 days in Daniel's time that occurred, it's been lost to antiquity. We don't know what it was. Our assumption is this is something that's prophetic, speaking in, in um, symbolism. And I'll get to these symbols in a bit because there's a whole lot of them in Daniel related to time. So Daniel um, saw the vision and in verse 15 it says he sought for the meaning. He, he didn't know what he was looking at. And so there was a man standing before him or someone that looked like a man in verse 15. Once again, this is some kind of supernatural being whether a redeemed human being or an angelic being, we don't know. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So now we've got Gabriel in the mix. And he came near to where I stood, and when I was there, I was afraid, and I think I'd have been afraid too. Fell on my face, but he said, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. Does everybody see that in verse 17? And so he says, this has to do with the end of time, okay? Let me just pause right there for a second. In, in a, several more verses, we're going to find out that the, the ram represented the uh, Medo-Persian Empire, represents a Medo-Persian Empire, and the goat represents a Greek Empire. Daniel is living at the time of the Medo-Persian Empire. It's about to conquer Babylon, okay? That's not the distant future if it's the Medo-Persian Empire. The Greek Empire is going to come right behind the Medo-Persian Empire. So if this is talking about something distant at the end of time, it's not what's happening in Daniel's day. Agreed? I'm just giving you some more possibilities because people generally have this all sewed up and what they think may or may not be so. So uh, he touched Daniel. He said this is for the appointed time of the end. In verse 20, the ram which you saw having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia. Now two kingdoms came together, kingdom of the Medes, the kingdom of the Persians to form the Medo-Persian empire. Those two horns make sense. Okay. Medo-Persian empire. And the rough goat is the king of Greece. And the second horn or the great horn that's between his eyes is the first king. Could well refer to Alexander the great. He was the greatest king possible. Now that uh, being broken, whereas you saw four stood up for it, the one horn was broke off, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. So they won't have the same power as this first king. It'll be broken into quarters. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. This um, dark sentences is like riddles or enigmas. It's mysteries shall stand up and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. In other words, there's going to be something beyond normal human abilities. He shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and it shall destroy the mighty and the holy people or the holy ones. This, by the way, is again, the Kadashim. The holy people is it, the holy ones is used again there. And though his policy, or through his policy, he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Now, who is this guy typically thought of in what you've read? The Antichrist. That's right. Most people assume this guy is the, uh, the Antichrist, the guy that's referred to in uh, are alluded to in Revelation. The term Antichrist is never used in Revelation, by the way. It is used by John, but it's not used in Revelation. It's used in uh, 1st and 3rd John about a spirit that denies Jesus as the Son of God, not about an individual person. But this guy is a bad guy, and many people um, believe that he's also the guy that's referred to in Daniel chapter 7. Remember, there's a guy who was overcoming the saints until a judgment was ruled on behalf of the saints. And then um, at that point, they were able to overcome him. And so um, uh, it says he'll be broken without hand. 
So this is something to do supernatural. The Lord's going to intervene. Once again, Daniel chapter 7, this, um, there's an individual overcoming the saints. It's like the end of days until a certain point when a judgment is ruled, a judgment is rendered on behalf of the saints, and then the Lord steps in and overcomes this guy. And so we generally tie this guy to that. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Therefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days, in verse 26. That's the distant future. Many days refers to the distant future. So in chapter, uh, verse 27, the last verse, Daniel fainted. He was sick. He was overcome from the magnitude of what he saw. And uh, he was astonished at the vision, but nobody understood it. So let's just pause with this a second. So look, look at your notes with me. Under Daniel um, chapter 8, the ram, the goat, and the little horn. So Daniel received another vision, Sushan, two years later. The vision's about a ram and a goat fighting. Two saints discussed the sacrifices in the temple and the cessation of sacrifices. Gabriel comes and gives Daniel an interpretation of the vision, which he doesn't understand. Daniel is told he's being shown things that will occur later in the time of wrath. One translation says, in the time of wrath in the NIV, concerning the Medes and the Persians and Greek kings. Now, this could refer to what happened immediately in Daniel's day and after, but it doesn't sound like it to me. What does it sound like to y'all? The time of wrath, the, the distant um, future that we just read several different ways doesn't sound like something that was going to happen in Daniel's day to me. Or if it's alluding to Daniel's day, it's not alluding to just Jan Daniel's day. And so the reason I'm saying this is because a lot of Jewish expositors try to make this like immediately the, uh, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, make it the fulfillment of all of this. We see other possibilities in this than they do. And um, some of it we don't know yet. So I'm still reading in the notes, Daniel 8, 19. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath, because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings, plural, of Media and Persia, and the shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between his eyes is the first king. So that may well refer to Alexander, the, the large horn, and then something after. Note the visions for the distant future. In 826, we read in the Amplified, the vision of the evenings and mornings which has been told to you is true, but keep the vision a secret, for it has to do with many days in the now distant future. And although that's amplified, it, it captures the idea of the text. So the, the, the now distant future, it's not defined, but it's out there. So the vision of the ram and the shaggy goat was given approximately 549 B.C. I'm going to start giving you some times because I'm going to fill in some theories as we go that are commonly bandied about. Daniel has a vision of a ram and a goat fighting. Gabriel identifies the ram as Persia and the, Greek, the goat as Greece. The two horns of the ram are identified in the text of the two kings of Media and Persia. I already explained that. The one horn is identified as the first Greek king. Gabriel says the vision is about the time of wrath. This is where a lot of New Testament commentators get the great tribulation. You know, this idea of tying Daniel to the great tribulation that's referred to in Revelation time of wrath. Gabriel specifically said it's about the distant future. Daniel says he didn't understand it. It was beyond understanding. So although Daniel saw it, it wasn't given, he wasn't given clarity on what all of it meant in his generation. Now, we're going we're gonna to step aside from the distant prophetic stuff and go, we're staying in Daniel, but we're going to look at Daniel in a different light in chapter 9. And then he's going to get prophetic on us again in chapter 9. In the Bible, there's a number of individuals that are representative of, um, are, are very great examples of intercessors. And so, everybody in this room has a relationship with Jesus Christ. That puts us in a position, as far as I know, that puts us in a position of having access to the throne of God to present petitions. There are other people in the world who do not have that relationship. They can't approach the throne of grace with anything other than, I surrender. And so you and I are in a position to pray for those who are not yet at the point of having that relationship. To pray for another on their behalf is to intercede. 
And so one of the great examples in the scriptures of the intercessor is Moses. Remember the Lord at one point was so upset with the children of Israel. He said, Moses, get out of the way. I'm going to kill all of them. Moses prayed for them and said, you know, Lord, please don't do this. The, the, the Egyptians are going to talk bad about you. You know, these are your people. We can do this. Don't, don't do that. If you're going to do that, block my name out of the book. That's intercession. He was, he was standing before God, not because of his own sins, but because of their sins. And so Daniel is going to take that a different level. Now, there's a, there's a term, it's a theological term, but you'll all understand it. Vicarious repentance. Has anybody here never heard the term vicarious repentance? Vicarious repentance means to repent for something you didn't do that somebody else did. Vicarious repentance means to repent for the sins of somebody else. That is, that is also a New Testament concept, but we're not going to go into the New Testament part of it today. But Daniel understood vicarious repentance as an intercessor. So he's going he's gonna, to, in chapter 9, present the sins of his people, not as their sins, but as our sins. Part of this idea of intercession, standing in the place of another before God, is identifying with the sinner, not as, Lord, they sinned against you, but Lord, we sinned against you. Remember Moses, the example of Moses. Lord, if you're going to blot them out of your book, blot me out of your book. He's standing with the people that sinned against God and asking for mercy. So vicarious uh, repentance is the idea of you're, you're not taking the sin on yourself like Jesus did. It's not that. But you're identifying their sins as your own. So let me give you an example in our, in our time. You could say, Lord, forgive us for abortion, even if you never had, were involved in an abortion. You follow me? Because you have a relationship with God, you could say, Lord, forgive our nation for abortion. We have sinned against you by killing these babies. That's different than saying, Lord, they have done it. It's a different position theologically, and it's different. The Lord receives it differently. So watch Daniel. First in chapter 9, he gives the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus. And this Ahasuerus may or may not have been um, the same Ahasuerus that Esther was married to, probably one of his descendants. There were three different Ahasuerus's. Of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the number of years whereof the word of the Lord had come to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now, we know 2,000 years later that they had 70 years of captivity. But Daniel is in real time reading the scriptures. And Jeremiah was one of his contemporaries. By the time chapter 9 is written, Jeremiah is probably gone to be with the Lord. But his word is already part of the, the scriptures. It later became canonized in the Bible. So he understood from, from Jeremiah. Now look in your notes under chapter 9, because I've got the, the prophecy of Jeremiah in chapter 25 of Jeremiah, verse 11. Jeremiah said, This whole country will become a desolate wasteland, and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation and the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and I will make it desolate forever. And by the way, I just include 2 Chronicles 36, 21, because it says why there was 70 years. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rest all the time of its desolation. It rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. So the, the 70 Sabbath rest represented 70 Sabbath years they had not celebrated. So Jeremiah prophesied this. And we, we know looking back, yeah, that's what's going to happen. But Daniel is still in captivity. Daniel knew this was the word of the Lord. But Daniel didn't just say, oh, well, he's going to do it. Daniel started to intercede and said, Lord, you spoke this. Now, Lord, I'm asking you to do it. And so how many of you in this room have ever had a prophetic word? Somebody says, the Lord says this about you. You're going to do this. You're going to go here. Has everybody here had somebody tell them the Lord says? Well, part of that equation is praying into it. Lord, you said. And so Daniel is about to pursue that. So he understood this is the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah. And he understood the 70 years was about up. And so in verse 3, he said, I set my face to the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So you know, Daniel, why are you going to all this trouble? God said he's going to do it. Well, Daniel, 
wanted to see it come to pass. So he, he prayed over that word to energize it, if you will, or to remind the Lord of it. I prayed to the Lord my God, and I made my confession. And I said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, or the great and awesome God, keeping covenant mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. Verse 5, notice the pronoun, we have sinned. Everybody see that? No matter what text you're using, what version you're using, he uses a, a plural pronoun. It's, it's not they, it's not I, it's we. He's identifying, we have sinned. Now remember, Daniel was a little boy. When he was taken into captivity, he wasn't putting idols in Israel. He wasn't sacrificing babies to Molech. He wasn't doing the things that brought the destruction on. He wasn't in a position of power to say, we're not going to observe the Sabbath years. He didn't do any of this, but he's saying he did it. We have sinned. We've committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. We have rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we listened to your servants, the prophets, which spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our prophets. He continues with this we, 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 everything. O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us, confusion of face or shame. We're shame. We're, shame is our lot. As at this day to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, to all Israel that are near and that are far off, through all the countries wherever you've driven them, because of their trespasses, they have trespassed against you. O oh Lord, to us belongs confusion of face, to our kings, our princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. So Daniel doesn't just throw this thing down one time. He keeps circling back to it. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws. Now Daniel did obey the voice of the Lord, but he's saying he didn't because he's identifying with those that did not, asking for mercy. Which he set before us through his servants, the prophets. Yea, all Israel have transgressed your law, even by departing, so that they might not obey your voice. Therefore, the curse is poured out upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us, to bring our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole of heaven has not been done, has been done to Jerusalem. So the, the place that had been blessed, Moses had promised, if you obey, you'll be blessed. But if you disobey, you're going to be run out of the country. The Lord's going to judge you. And it's going to be a stricter judgment than those that never had the word of God. Just a quick aside, I'm really glad y'all are here learning the Bible, um, but there's a, there's a price to pay. The more you learn, the more you're responsible for. In the New Testament, the Lord puts it this way. He says, the servant that did not do his master's will and knew to do it will be bitten, beaten with many stripes, but the one who didn't do it, do it and didn't know his master's will will be beaten with few stripes. And so there's a difference when you know versus when you don't know the will of the Lord. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us. Yet we, we, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. And then verse 14, for we obeyed not his voice. Verse 15, we have sinned, we've done wickedly. He just continues on with that. And so Daniel takes this position between, um, between God Almighty. He vicariously repents for not only um, his family, but for all of Israel. And going backwards to the time of the sin, he actually is addressing things, a lot of the stuff that's happened by people that are no longer even alive that have brought this to pass. And so he continues in verse 16, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I beseech you, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because for our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers, Jerusalem and your people are become a reproach to all that are about us. Now, therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and cause your face to shine upon your sanctuary that is desolate, 
for the Lord's sake. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications for you, for our righteousness, but for your great mercies. And then verse 19, a final plea. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, hearken or listen. And don't defer, don't delay. For your own sake, O oh my God, for your city and for your people who are called by your name. And so if you ever want an example of how to intercede for someone, um, and once again, you're all in a position to take uh, petitions before the Lord for other people, this is how you do it. This is, um, uh, it's called identification, this idea of identifying with the sins of others as your own. There's a book called Reese Howell's Intercessor, and he identified different aspects of intercession. And one was identification, that you can't pray for someone effectively unless you can identify with their situation and their sin. Another phase of, of intercession is agony. And I'm quite sure Daniel agonized over the sins of his nation. But it, it always fascinates me that Daniel saw the meter running, saw the prophecy of Jeremiah, knew it was the word of the Lord, and yet he felt fervently he had to confess these things that there was some part of what Daniel did to um, enable the Lord to fulfill that 70-year promise. In other words, this is not meaning, meaningless stuff that he's doing here. He's not just, this is not an exercise in futility. This is written in the scriptures under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And there's something in this that has to do with the fulfillment of the promise God made to Jeremiah. 70 years. Daniel says, you said 70 years. It's about 70 years now. Forgive us, God. Let this be it. And so let me give you a couple of possibilities. There were three different groups carried into captivity, into Babylonian captivity. It started in 606 B.C. The first one is in 606. Second group went in 597 B.C. Third group in 586 B.C. If the meter started running with the first group, it would have ended somewhere around... Um, 536 B.C. If it started with the last group, it would have ended some 30 years later. You follow me? I think what Daniel was praying, part of what he was praying was, let this thing start and end at the earliest possible moment. You know, it could have, the Lord had a range of time when he wanted to say, this is when the meter starts. I think Daniel was saying, Lord, I want the meter to start with the first group that went into captivity. I think that was part of what he was praying. Let this thing come to pass. This guy was a man greatly beloved by God, and he knew how to pray, and he knew what the Lord's ways were. And so this was, um, this was much more than a nice guy confessing old sins just to be nice. This was some kind of transaction that had to take place. And so on the heels of this fantastic intercession for the nation of Israel, Something supernatural happens, a, a really amazing uh, visitation occurs. So in verse 20, while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, who I'd seen at the beginning in the vision previously, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening uh, sacrifice, the evening oblation or the evening sacrifice. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I'm come now to give you skill and understanding. Now, verse 22 always perplexes me because he says, I've come to give you understanding. In a few minutes, Daniel's going to say, I don't understand. But Daniel is told several of these visions. It's going to happen again in 10, 11, 12. I'm coming to give you understanding. Okay, explain it. Well, I don't understand. Same thing happens in chapter 7. But he gets a look at the future. In verse 23, at the beginning of your prayers, the commandment came forth, and I'm come forth to give you, because you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Now, this is one of these, verse 24 gives one of these cryptic time periods. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your holy city, what? To finish the transgression. To take note of that, because he's going to give several specific things that are going to happen after these 70 weeks. 
70 weeks, by the way, I don't know how it's translated in your Bible. It's actually 77s, 77s. We assume it's weeks, but it's 77s is what it says in the text in Hebrew. But it's, at the end of these 77s, we're going to put an end to transgression and we're going to make an end of sin and we're going to make reconciliation for iniquity. We're going to make atonement for iniquity. And we're going to bring in everlasting righteousness and we're going to seal up the vision and prophecy and we're going to anoint the Holy of Holies. That King James says most holy is the Holy of Holies. So those are very explicit things. Now let's just pause right there for a second. So go back to your notes in Daniel chapter 9. So in verse 1 and 2, Daniel um, read that Jeremiah had prophesied 70 years of captivity for Jerusalem. Knowing God's word, Daniel prays for the 70 years to be over. He repents for um, Israel and Judah. Gabriel arrives in response to Daniel's prayer and tells him he's greatly loved and proceeds to give him, and it's in quotes, skill and understanding. And then um, Daniel is told 77s, and then all these things are going to happen. So they're, they're going to finish transgression. We're going to make an end of sins. We're going to make reconciliation for iniquity. We're going to bring in everlasting righteousness. And we're going to seal up the vision and prophecy, whatever that means. And we're going to anoint the Holy of Holies. So we'll come back to the notes in a second. So in verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem to the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven sevens. Seven weeks, it says in most texts. Seven sevens. So we got another condition here. There's going to be a commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem. Jerusalem's going to be rebuilt. When this was written, it's under, it had been destroyed for 70 years. And the Messiah is going to come. It says specifically, the Messiah is mentioned in this text in verse 25. It shall be seven weeks or, or um, seven sevens and three score and two weeks, another 62 weeks or 62 sevens. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score, that's 60 and two weeks, shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. So the city's going to be rebuilt, the city's going to be destroyed again. After the Messiah is cut off. He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. In the midst of the week he shall cause sacrifice and the oblation to cease. For the overspreading of abominations of abominations, he shall make it desolate, the abomination of desolations. You've heard that term before. For the overspreading of abominations he shall make desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. All right, I want to read just those last few verses in a different version, because it's a, um, gives a, starting with verse 24, just gives a different picture. Just listen to me on this one. I'm going to read verse 24. This is the, um, uh, what have I got here? The HCSB. Listen carefully. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to bring the rebellion to an end, to put a stop to sin, to wipe away iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place, or again, the holy of holies. Know and understand this from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah, the Prince, will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. That's cryptic language. It will be re rebuilt with a plaza and a moat, and it will be in difficult times. After those 62 weeks, the Messiah will be cut off, will have nothing. The people of the coming prince will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come with a flood. And until the end, there will be war. Desolations are decreed. He will make a firm covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and offering, and the abomination of desolation will be on a wing of the temple. Now, that wing of the temple is also the way it's worded in NIV and a lot of other more modern translations because it appears 
and a lot of the ancient manuscripts. So not in the temple, but on a wing of the temple. I'll come back to that. Until the decree, destruction is poured out on the desolation or the desolator. Now, look at your notes, Daniel 77s. This cryptic language about the 70 um, weeks, the 62 weeks, plus another um, seven, day, seven weeks on top of that, has, been, uh, has become part of mainstream evangelical thought. Is everybody familiar with the Left Behind series? And uh, you know the Left Behind series of books, the LaHaye books, and um, the, the whole theology wrapped around that? Well, a lot of this stuff comes out of Daniel, these, these cryptic terminologies of weeks. And so I want to give you some of what's being said. Look under special note under Daniel 24 to 27, Daniel 70. Sevens. Special note, though clearly drawing on the work of others, John Nelson Darby is credited with having said the 70th week of Daniel is yet to be fulfilled. How many of you have heard that that last seven is, is somewhere in the distant future? Nobody knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> okay, well, this guy said it. He was the person who suggested a 2,000-year gap between the 69th and the 70th week from Daniel 9.27. C.I. Schofield, Schofield's study Bible, used this commentary in his study Bible notes, and I've got the notes below there. These are weeks, or more accurately, sevens of years, 70 weeks of seven years each. Within these weeks, the national chastisement must be ended, the nation reestablished in everlasting righteousness, Daniel 9.24, the 70 weeks are divided into seven, 49 years. 62 equals 434 years. All this gets crazy, con convoluted. One equals seven years. In the seven weeks equals 49 years, Jerusalem was to be rebuilt in troublous times. This was fulfilled, as Ezra and Nehemiah record, 62 weeks equals 434 years. Thereafter, Messiah was to come, according to Daniel 9.25. This was fulfilled in the birth and manifestation of Christ. Daniel 9.26 is obviously of an indeterminate period. The date of the crucifixion is not fixed. It's only said to be after the three score and two weeks. It is the first event in Daniel 9.26. The second event is the destruction of the city, which was fulfilled in 70 A.D., then unto the end, a period not fixed, but which has already lasted nearly 2,000 years. Between the 69th week, after which Messiah was cut off, and the 70th week, within which the little horn of Daniel 7, he ties these together, will run his awful course, intervenes the entire church age. Daniel 7, uh, 927 deals with the last three and a half years of the seven, which are identical with the great tribulation. And he refers to Matthew 24. 15 to 28, time of trouble, Daniel 12, and the hour of temptation, Revelation 3. And so these things, if, if you haven't heard what I just gave you, the footnote, that was adopted by many study Bibles about 100 years ago. Schofield's study Bible was in the early 1900s. By the, um, the, the mid-20th century, during the various outpourings that were occurring, the healing revivals, the uh, re evangelistic crusades with Oral Roberts, Billy Graham's and all. This became mainstream theology, this understanding of the tie-in of these time periods and so forth. Um, the, the Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey was written in 1970, sold over 9 million copies. It espoused, it just took these same footnotes and expanded on them. And so this became kind of mainstream thought, this interpretation. But let me give you some more breakdown on this. And so Artaxerxes does, in fact, decree permission to rebuild Jerusalem. And um, as Schofield said, it, you can, there's a way of manipulating these 69 times 7 weeks of years for 483 years. This comes to 32 AD, which is about the time of the cross. Agreed? But is that lunar years or solar years? To finish transgression, did Jesus finish transgression? He paid for all sins on the cross. Absolutely. Are, but are people still sinning? Absolutely they are. So what does Daniel mean from um, this, this verse 25, or excuse me, from verse 24? 
Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon the holy city to finish transgression. What does it mean to finish transgression? Maybe it means the coming of Christ. Maybe it means the, the, the cross of Christ. To make an end of sins, it says specifically in the text. Jesus brought a remedy to sin, but sin is still occurring. To make reconciliation for iniquity or atonement for iniquity. Well, he certainly did that. To bring in everlasting righteousness. Well, he's the prince of righteousness. So perhaps that's the interpretation of that. But we're certainly not in a righteous world since his death, burial, and resurrection. The rest of the world is not given up. But what does it mean to seal up the vision and prophecy? And so I'll give you some of the, the thoughts on the seal up vision and prophecy. Some have said that has to do with the closing of the Old Testament canon, that the timing may relate to Malachi. We don't know what it means to seal up the vision and prophecy. Um, to anoint the Holy of Holies. That's a difficult one. The, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus applied his blood to the mercy seat of heaven. Is it talking about the mercy seat of heaven? We don't know. Let me tell you, everybody, I know that I've just dumped a whole lot of stuff on you. Take a breath. Everybody take a breath. <sighs> okay. There's a guy who is no longer among the living. <laughs> His name was Ron Wyatt. Some years ago, about 30 years ago or more, um, he was an uh, amateur archaeologist, and he found his way to the Holy Land. He supposedly discovered the real Mount Sinai. He supposedly discovered the place where the Red Sea crossing was, and he supposedly found the Ark of the Covenant. Has anybody ever heard this story? And so, have you ever heard this story? So, Ron Wyatt, there's a video series. When you get home, look up Ron Wyatt video series, Ark of the Covenant. And so, Ron Wyatt claimed that there are tunnels under the Temple Mount. There are tunnels under the Temple Mount. We know, I've been in some of them. There are tunnels under the Temple Mount. In, Je in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah is told to buy a field, remember? And he gets a deed to this field. It's during the siege of Jerusalem. And the Lord tells Jeremiah to bury this uh, deed in a jar for the future. And so Ron Wyatt claims that was the deed to a place in Israel called Jeremiah's Grotto. That is a real place. He said there's a tunnel that he found leading off of Jeremiah's Grotto that led him underground to the Ark of the Covenant, that Jeremiah had stored the Ark of the Covenant under the ground. Not only has he stored the Ark of the Covenant under the ground, according to Ron, Myatt, uh, Ron Wyatt, it is directly under Golgotha and directly over the place where the cross of Christ was dropped into a permanent hole in the rock to hold crosses. Ron Wyatt says there's three of these peg holes. The central one was for Christ. And while Jesus was being crucified, his blood ran down that cross and fell on the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, thereby anointing the Holy of Holies with his blood. This is Wyatt. Again, Wyatt is no longer alive. Whether he was a liar or not, God knows. But there's a video series on this. The, the um, antiquities departments in Israel denied he ever did any of this. But he has a big following even to this day. And his descendants have his website still going. And the guy found some stuff. But whether he found the Ark of the Covenant, whether it's under Golgotha, I don't believe it. But maybe, I, I don't, you know, I'm not accusing the guy. Let the, we'll let the devil accuse the guy. But it's, uh, uh, what does it mean to anoint the Holy of Holies? Does it mean Jesus applying the blood of, of uh, his own blood to the mercy seat of heaven? What does it mean? We don't know. But there's lots of interpretations. And so, in your notes, continuing, in your notes on the middle of that page under Daniel um, 9, verse 24 to 27, down toward the bottom, I've got another quote from Daniel 9, 27 that talks about a wing of the temple. Does everybody see that from the NIV? Daniel 9, 27, He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven, in the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on a wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So on a wing of the temple, and everybody look this way again. Um, in the temple mount, this is the, uh, the dome of the rock is up here. The wailing wall is down here. You've seen the pictures and all that. 
The, uh, the Dome of the Rock is central to the, um, the compound up there. But the, the scholars have found that the Holy of Holies was not under what's the Dome of the Rock. It was actually under a little area over here. It's a little cupola. There's a little thing that marks it. In other words, it wasn't here. It was on a wing of the temple. It was not under the Dome of the Rock. So some scholars believe that the abomination that makes desolate on the wing of the temple is referring to Islam, that that made a permanent stopping of the sacrificial system up there in the Holy of Holies. You see the, the imagery. So they, this is, again, look this up when you get a chance. I've been in the tunnel underneath the mount where they say you can get as close to the um, Holy of Holies. You can get within about 20 feet of where they say it was under the temple mount. It's, it's, a, uh, it's controlled by the government of Israel. Um, anyway, the Knesset got us in there. But the, the wing of the temple, the, um, the mosque property, is over a, a wing of the temple that is uh, where the Holy of Holies was. And so it was not a wing of the, the Solomon's temple. It's a wing of that doggone mosque is over the Holy of Holies. Maybe the language refers to a wing of the, the mosque desolating or desecrating the Holy of Holies. We don't know. It's a possibility. But there's some math that has to do with these sevens. Look in your notes. This has been... You'll find this if you go searching for some of these interpretations of Daniel's time. So Daniel's 70 week, 70th week is about a wing of the temple being made desolate. This is a unique 2,520 Hebrew years or 2,484 solar years. Cyrus issued the decree to return to Israel, uh, or for Israel to return and rebuild in 536 B.C., the middle of this week would be 706 A.D. The Dome of the Rock was built on a wing of the temple, 706 A.D. The end of this special week would be 1948, when the nation of Israel was reestablished. Another possibility, right? So maybe the abomination that makes desolate is not an antichrist. Maybe it's Islam. Maybe it's Islam desecrating the temple mount. There's math to substantiate it, depending on how you do the math. Let's continue because there's more math. I, I hope I'm not boring you guys. I know all this is really um, complicated, but I got it in writing. You can think about it later. And so the unexplained time pay, periods in Daniel. So I just want, and these are all quoted from the King James. They're worded differently in different versions, but these are intentionally cryptic by the Holy Spirit. Number one, a season and a time, Daniel 7:12. Whatever that means. A time, times, and the dividing of time. Daniel 7.25. 2,300 days. Daniel 8.14. 70 weeks. Daniel 9.14. 7 weeks. Daniel 9.25. 62 weeks. Daniel 9.25. 1 week. Daniel 9.27. A time, times, and a half. Daniel 12.7. 1200, excuse me, 1290 days, Daniel 12, 11. 1335 days, Daniel 12, 12. So look, look back this way again. The Lord was able to say exactly what he wanted to say. These things were intentionally recorded symbolic and cryptic. They're not explicit. But I can tell you that um, having read a whole lot of different books over the years. There are a lot of people think they have all these dates figured out. There's a lot of people that think they have these dates all figured out. I'm telling you Almighty God made them cryptic. I'm also telling you that God over and over again, the text of Daniel says, these things are hidden till the time of the end. So if they've been generally agreed on for 2,000 years, I suspect what we agreed on may or may not be accurate. So let's just continue. Daniel 7.1 in the first year of Del Shazar, Daniel heard this prophecy in 552 B.C. And he talks about time, times, and the dividing of time. So time and times and a half time, or the dividing of time, may be two and a half, not three and a half, Hebraically. How many of you have heard that said that that's three and a half years? Yeah, unequivocally. Hebraically, from a linguistic perspective, it may mean two and a half, not three and a half. 
So time times and a half times, if it's two and a half, it may be 2,500 years, not three and a half or 3,500 years. We don't know. Israel was under control of Gentiles from 552 B.C. until 1948. From 552 B.C. until 1948 is 2,500 years, coincidentally. This is just another way of, I'm just giving you more possibilities here for why we don't know for, for fact what this is. Remember, the saints in Daniel's day were the Jews, not the church. Daniel 12, see notes below. So Daniel 12, we hadn't gotten to, but it mentions time, times, and a half times. It mentions 2,290 days um, or um, 1,290 days. So time, times, and a half time, again, maybe two and a half, not three and a half, um, maybe 2,500 years, not three three and a half years or 3,500 years. Daniel heard this in about 533 B.C., this particular prophecy, Daniel 12. From 533 to 1967 is 2,500 years when they retook Jerusalem. So 1948 is significant. Israel was established. 1967 is significant. Um, They retook Jerusalem. 730 was significant. They built the Dome of the Rock. You see these different things, these different dates. Uh, uh, There's a lot of possibilities here. From the date sacrifices were abolished in 586 to the Dome of the Rock, 688 to 705 A.D. was approximately 1,290 years. Maybe it's talking about that in Daniel chapter 12. So here's what we know. The text itself tells us that these two kingdoms, the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, are going to play a part in end-time events. That's either recycling what has already occurred or something that occurred during the first go-round is going to have something to do with end-time events. We know that this vision of these two animals in Daniel chapter 9 represents those two kingdoms. We know that the angel of the Lord told Daniel, this is for the distant future. And so next week, and I I know that um, not all of you have this, but if you've still got your notes from last week, Look at those two charts I gave you last week. If you don't have copies of those, I'll have some more copies next week. Look at those charts and think about the images. And remember what I'm telling you now. The head of gold is identified in Daniel chapter 2 as Nebuchadnezzar. We can extend that to say the Babylonian Empire. In Daniel chapter 9, the the goat and the ram are identified as the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. The rest of these kingdoms, we don't know who they are. You know, you hear it's a Roman Empire, it's a rebuilt Roman Empire, maybe, we don't know. And so there's a lot, there's a lot Pitts doesn't know, and I suspect there's a lot that we, the church, collectively don't know about what's coming. The Lord intentionally made these things mystical to Daniel. And so I like to, I prefer to stick with what we can know, you know. We know Jesus is coming. We know that ultimately the saints win because judgment is rendered on behalf of the saints. We know the Son of Man is given a kingdom that will never pass away from Daniel chapter 7. We know that this is going to be difficult. There's going to be trials and tribulations. There's going to be evil rising up. Uh, But ultimately, those who persevere, those who continue in the Lord, will rule and reign with Him. The victory is assured. And I think that some of these things in Daniel... This is, I'm getting into opinion now. We'll we'll know what's going on when it starts to unfold. I don't think we're going to know in advance as much as we think we do. I think when it actually starts to unfold, we'll be able to say, oh, that was the, what the abomination that makes desolate. That's what you were talking about. This is the, the horn that overcomes the saints and has something to do with casting down the host of heaven. That's what you meant by that. These things are mystical. And so, um, uh, by all means, think about it, meditate on it, pray about it, speculate. But don't, if you've got a firm opinion on these things, I suggest you write it down in pencil because you may have to erase it later and change what you wrote down. You know? Is that fair enough? Let's quit there tonight. And uh, I said, read those uh, charts over again. Daniel 10, 11, and 12 is one vision. It could literally be one chapter. So Daniel 10, 11, and 12, we'll spend time on next week, and we'll also review the whole book of Daniel. 
If I got a little too technical with all these dates and numbers tonight, I apologize, but I guess I'm a little bit of a wonk on these prophecy books that I've read so many of. But I thought y'all would like to hear some of these different interpretations of the of the timelines, what they might mean. So the next time your friend tells you, no, definitively it means this, you can say, well, it might mean that, or it might mean this. We okay? So let's pray, and then if anybody needs prayer, we can pray uh, afterwards. I will definitely be here teaching next week, and then after next week, Shane Heath is going to teach for two weeks while I'm in Guinea. He'll be teaching on the Minor Prophets, but I'll finish Daniel next week, okay? So Lord, um, uh, I hope I didn't confuse the folks that were listening too much. God, um, you're the one that brings order out of the chaos. Lord, um, with my limited ability, I tried to present a little of the what's known and a little of what others have suggested might be possibilities. God, um, I just pray that you'd protect the hearers from things that are not true, whether from my mouth or things that they've read. And Lord, I ask that you would speak to us about these things, how we might apply them to our own lives. And God, if we are indeed in the days that Daniel saw and if the beginning of these things is unfolding, Lord, let us have the, the wisdom to be positioned where you want us to be in relation to all of these things, God. We know that those that are in right relationship with you will be on the right side of history. And so, God, at the end of days, we, we pray that our hearts will be right toward you. I pray that for my friends here as well, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, God bless y'all.